be reading from the book of Nehemiah. If you don't have a Bible, I think maybe your the scriptures all printed in your bulletin. Chapter 13. Stand with me as we read from God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 13. We'll begin reading at verse and before this, Elisha bid the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offering, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters, the offerings of the priests. But all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Elisha did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chamber. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Leave your Bibles open and bow your heads. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray that you may teach us from it this morning. And for that, we will thank you. Amen. You may be seated. This week, when the service master truck pulled in, to take down that drying equipment in the parsonage that's just about driving Linda and I crazy from the noise. Uh, that was from the water problems that we've had, and just in case uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. The guy that came in to take it down was not the guy that we were expecting to see. When he came in, I told him, I said, I was expecting to see Travis and Kyle to come back. Those were the two guys that had been working, cleaning up the damage. And he said, no, they couldn't come today. They were busy cleaning up a place where sewage had overflowed into a home. And that'd be a nice job. I said, boy, that'd be he said, oh, that, that's not so bad. You should see some of the things we get into. We get into crime scenes and suicides. And he said, you, you just can't imagine some of the messes that we have to clean up. So sewage so isn't even all that bad. Sounds bad to me. <laughs> but when sewage overflows, it has to take precedence over some other thing. And it has to be dealt with right away, doesn't it? Uh, isn't that what we would do if sewage overflowed into the church? We would clean it up for your home. Get rid of it as quick as we possibly could. I think we all know that our God is holy. And he will not tolerate unholy living in his people. Yet many people today think they can wallow in the sewage of sin and even bring it into the church and it won't bother God in the least. Wrong. Very wrong. My mind went back to our scripture for this morning as I was thinking about that, that sewage. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily my mind that works, but I, the way the Lord speaks to me. Nehemiah was the Jewish leader and Ezra the priest who helped rebuild and restore Jerusalem. 
And the temple, uh, after the Jews had returned from the Babylonian captivity, I think most of us that are knowledgeable at all of our Old Testament know that. And if you read the book of Nehemiah before our scripture reading, you know that when they came back, they were successful in restoring things back as they should have been. The people repented of their evil ways. And to make a long story short, Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 30 says, the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates, and the wall. Verse 6 tells us that Nehemiah then got called back after he'd accomplished the rebuilding. He was called back to Babylon by Xerxes for some time. We're not told how long, but after the restoration, he's called back to Babylon. And when he returns, he is absolutely dismayed by what he finds. Verse 4 said that Elisha, and I have trouble pronouncing that guy's name, so I hope I got that right again. He's the current priest who was in charge of the temple. When Nehemiah gets back, he finds that he has allied himself to Tobiah. Now, who's Tobiah? Well, you know if you've read the rest of the book and the, in front of that, that Tobiah was an Ammonite, who had allied himself with Sanballat. And if you remember the story of the book of Nehemiah, as they're restoring the walls and what have you, Nehemiah's main enemies were Tobiah and Sanballat. And they tried many things to keep them from being successful in rebuilding the walls. Matter of fact, as some would build, the other, others had to stand guard and watch so that Sambalat and Tobiah and, and others would not uh, stop them from rebuilding the temple. So you can imagine Nehemiah's shock when he returns from his time in Babylon and he finds Tobiah, their enemy, living in a room in the temple. And he's doing it with the approval of the high priest. Uh, so what does Nehemiah do? Verses 8 and 9 says, He said, It grieved me sore. Now that's King James for he was upset. <laughs> uh, he was furious. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. What did he do? He threw Tobiah out of the temple. <coughs> threw all his stuff out of the temple. In the same way that Jesus threw out the money changers when he saw how they had desecrated the temple. And then they cleansed the quarters where Tobiah had been living. You see... Tobiah's presence had defiled the temple in the same way that sewage would defile the church today or that sin will defile the lives of Christians that God has called to live a holy life. Tobiah's presence there, actually taking up residence there, defiled the temple. Now, we didn't read this, but if you back up a few verses there in verse 1 before this, God had strictly forbid any Ammonite from even entering the temple, much less living there. And now here is Tobiah, an Ammonite, the sworn enemy of Israel. He's actually living in the temple. That's hard to, uh, to get a grip on and to understand how they can have sunk that low as to allow that to happen. But why would the high priest let Tobiah live in the temple? That's the question you say to yourself. Why in the world would he do that? 
Well, he did it because he had allowed his grandson to marry Sanballat's daughter, which then gave him a connection to Tobiah. You know how it is sometimes with family. We don't always do the right thing with family. We sometimes let our standards down with family. And so the result is, here's Tobiah living in the temple, who then polluted the house of God. When God's people become unequally yoked to unbelievers, as 2 Corinthians 6.14 forbids us and warns us about being, and when God's people become a little too cozy with the world, what happens is that the unbeliever will usually pull us down and pull us away from God's call to holy living. I mean, I know we're trying to, to work with the sinful people and witnessing to them and what have you and trying to get them to, to see the light. We should be. But we need to be very, very careful because if we get a little too cozy, they'll end up pulling us down instead of us bringing them up. God has called His people and His church to holiness. Sin and rebellion and dirty lives and compromises with the world, that will never do. God will never be happy with that. Now, a number of years before he died, the beloved Southern Baptist evangelist, preacher Vance Havner, said this. The world and the professing church first flirted with each other. Then they fell in love. And now the wedding is upon us. Now Vance Havner has been dead for I think probably 40 years. Can you imagine what he would have said had he still been alive today? to see how far down the church has sunk since his death. I can't imagine what he might have said. Just like the high priest's grandson that married Sam Ballard's daughter, the church of today has seen fit to unite itself with the world rather than staying separate from the world and being the spotless, holy, bride of Christ. Now, some liberal Christians, including many evangelicals today as well, would bristle in that, with that and say, well, what do you mean, preacher? We're still the bride of Christ. You're just too hopelessly old-fashioned. You need to get with it. Well, I might be old-fashioned, but the way I read my Bible, the real bride of Christ keeps herself pure and clean and unspotted from the world. Doesn't it? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Speaking about the church, Ephesians 5, 26-27 says that He sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. But a watered-down, compromised version of Christianity now dominates here in America to the point that anybody that tries to call the church to holiness these days is going to be looked at as legalistic and old-fashioned and out of touch. By and large now, for at least a generation, the evangelical church as a whole has pretty much abandoned its preaching against sin and for holiness, only to replace it 
with a different version of the gospel which allows a person to feel comfortable in their sins as well as good about themselves while they're committing them. They can go to a church and not even feel guilty about the way they're living because nobody's preaching against what's wrong. These days, if a person does go to a church that still preaches the truth, which don't tell me a church is preaching the truth if it doesn't preach about holiness, if it doesn't preach about God's hatred of sin, if it doesn't preach about judgment against unrepented sinners, hell, that kind of stuff, that person will either get saved by going to that church, or else they'll probably go to another church that prefers to just talk about God's love and never ruffle a feather on your back and make you feel very comfortable. A church that will do a lot of singing and the singing resembles more of a rock concert atmosphere and then if there's any time left the pastor will get up and give a little short sermonette more of a psycho babble based sermonette than one that's true to God's holy word. And somebody might go to that church for an entire year and never hear a word about sin or judgment or hell or anything like that. But they'll go away feeling good about themselves. And if they go to a church like that, there they can be a social drinker without anybody batting an eye at them. Maybe they can smoke. They don't have to worry about dressing modestly. They don't have to watch their language as closely there. They can go to dirty movies. They don't have to go to church whenever they feel like it. That kind of stuff. But folk, the sewage has overflowed into the church these days. And few are even bothered by the smell of it anymore. <laughs> But I can assure you that our holy God that has called his church to holiness, I can assure you he is still bothered by the smell. Amen. 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 Now if the worldliness and the unholy living we are seeing today within the church wasn't bad enough already, now this stench of the acceptance of homosexuality as acceptable Christian conduct has now swept in like a flood. Today the church is facing a crisis unlike anything it has ever had to face before in its 2,000 years of church history. Because it's not from outside. Certain factions within the church itself are actually promoting homosexuality these days as acceptable behavior, even normal. Ministers themselves are practicing this abomination, and they can do it without being thrown out of their denomination. And so-called homosexual marriage is ripping segments of the church apart. We're seeing splits and stuff within all kinds of groups. And I've got to believe that very soon the church is going to be divided right down the middle. Those that think that's okay and those that don't. And they're doing it without any kind of fear of judgment from God upon them. Yet in the little book of Jude, verse 7 clearly says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 
There is no mistaking the fact that in both the Old and the New Testament, the homosexual act is considered a vile affection and a grievous sin to Almighty God. But in an attempt to neutralize the Bible's teaching on the subject, the supporters of homosexuality are now claiming that Jesus never mentioned it. Jesus never condemned it. Well, if you use a King James Bible, it is true that the King James Version does not use the word homosexuality one time. Not once. But it is not true that Jesus never condemned the act. Now why is that? Well, how could the word, or how could it, when the word homosexual was not coined as a word until the late 1800s? The King James Version could not use it as a word because it was translated some 300 years before the word was coined in English. Jesus used the word fornication to condemn the homosexual act as sin. Jude 7, that we just read a few moments ago, associated the homosexuality of Sodom and Gomorrah with the word fornication. Now what is fornication? The Bible uses the word fornication to describe any kind of sex outside the bounds of marriage. And remember, Marriage is between one man and one woman. So calling a union of two men or a union of two women a marriage doesn't make it one. Nor does saying that you love somebody make fornication okay. The definition of fornication would include any kind of heterosexual act before marriage. It would include homosexual relations at any time. It would include incest. It would include bestiality. It would include prostitution, pornography, Probably a few other things. So all sex outside of marriage is considered fornication by God. And it is sinful. Jesus in Matthew 15, 18 and in Mark 7, 20 said that any kind of fornication is sin and he said it defiles a man. You cannot be right with God. You cannot be living a pure, holy life while you're committing fornication of any kind. And the Bible tells us that just before the return of our Lord to this earth, the majority of the people on the earth will be turning to wickedness instead of to holiness. There is not going to be a tremendous revival some of the like some of the false prophets are claiming. That's not going to happen. And folks, we better be careful what we call revival these days. Because there hasn't been a genuine revival until people reject sin and start living holy lives. You can jump around and have all the hoopla and make all the noise and have all the excitement that you want. But until people start living right and changing their lives, there hasn't been a genuine revival. Many may call themselves Christians today, 
But holy living definitely is not in style, even within the church itself these days. Now, one of the sins that the Bible says that men will not repent of in the last days is fornication. Revelation 9.21 clearly says, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. We are heading into the days ahead with an ever-increasing explosion of homosexual acceptance even within the church itself we've already accepted people living together and all the other stuff that that people are really bad an eye at that anymore and you wonder why the divorce rates maybe going down a little it's going down because people aren't getting married simple as that uh, homosexuality was considered a terrible sin and an abomination by every Christian church that existed until just recently. Not that many years back. But before long, churches like ours that still believe what the Bible says on this subject they're going to be looked at as behind the times, homophobic, and downright hateful. Actually, we're looked at that way now. By men. Folks, this is an unprecedented time in the history of the Christian church that we are living in. The acceptance of homosexuality, fornication, is actually being preached from Christian pulpits. I was, I hope you were mortified as I was to see the Methodist Church give that preacher back his credentials that they defraud. Uh, God help us. I thought maybe there was some sense going on over there with the Methodists, but apparently not. Homosexuals themselves are actually standing boldly in pulpits. These days, pretending to be preachers of righteousness. What are they doing? They are deceiving and being deceived. They're overflowing the sewage of sin and unholy living into the church and into the thinking of its people. Those that practice this sin, or don't think I'm just harping on that, those that practice any kind of sin, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Regardless of what today's false teachers say. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 clearly says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And it goes on this uh, a number of other sins, none of those folk, it says, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Even if some preacher at their funeral preaches them into heaven, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus can free us from all sin, including the sin of homosexuality. And he can give us that hope Praise God, 1 John 1, 9 proclaims that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But how can we ever experience that cleansing from sin if we won't admit that certain acts, including homosexuality, are sinful and that there is stench in the nostrils of God. We're not going to repent of something that we think is okay. And think about it. Why would we be bothered by drinking and smoking and that kind of stuff if homosexuality doesn't bother us? 
<laughs> I mean, if that doesn't bother us, why would we get bothered about the other stuff? Uh, when he calls his church home, the only ones who are going are the ones who have allowed him to cleanse their lives from the smell and filth of the sewage of sin. Amen. But these are very dangerous times we're living in. The sewage of sin has overflowed into the church. And instead of cleaning it up, more and more of Christ's church is simply getting used to the stench. God help me or you if we ever get used to it. And hopefully we'll never see the day in this church where we have to get used to it. May God help us in these days. Turn your hymnal to number 516.